Hi, everyone. Welcome to program six of Itasca Water's Practical Water Wisdom Series. Thanks for taking the time today to attend this session. We really appreciate that you care about water quality. I'm John Downing, your host for today's program. Itasca Waters is a local nonprofit that has been active in Itasca County since 2009. If you haven't done so, you can check out our many accomplishments on our website, itascawaters.org, where you can also access a treasure trove of clean water practices. But in brief, our goal has been to find grants to do research on local water quality and to do educational events such as this one to share that knowledge. We have an outstanding lineup of speakers so far this year, and you can find a video recording of those programs on our website, itascawaters.org. And we look forward to two more programs in October and November, one dealing with forest resources and its influence on water quality, and another dealing with the effects of chloride and salt on fresh waters. Our hope is that you will gain new ideas and strategies for keeping our water healthy. We thank our partners for making these events possible. The Grand Rapids Area Community Foundation Fund, Minnesota Sea Grant, Itasca Soil and Water Conservation District, the Itasca Coalition of Lake Associations, Rapids Radio, KAXE, KBXE Radio, and the Blandon Foundation. Hosting the question and answer section today will be Itasca Waters board member and manager of the Itasca County AIS uh, program, uh, Bill Granches. The format for this session will be this. Our speaker will discuss the science behind this topic and then you give you some strategies and actions that you can use to help mitigate the problem. That will be followed by an opportunity to ask questions. To ask questions, simply click on Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type a brief question into the dialog box. You can do that at any time during our speaker's presentation, and Bill will read those questions to our speaker during the Q&A section. Similar questions may be combined, and we may not get to all the questions if we run out of time. This program is being recorded and will be available for viewing online through our website, itascawaters.org. Finally, we value your opinion and hope that you will complete uh, the evaluation uh, and you'll find the evaluation of the program and you'll find that link on the closing screen after the program ends and also the form will be sent out to you by email after today's session. Our topic for today is PFAS in Minnesota, understanding the impacts of forever chemicals and our speaker today has an outstanding resume. Sophie Green is the PFAS coordinator at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. She began this role in 2020 and has, been, has previously worked on human health risk assessment at the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, DC. Sophie has a master of science degree in geology from the University of Vermont and an undergraduate degree in chemistry from Carleton College. But for the next hour, Sophie Green is all ours. We are honored to have you with us. Sophie, welcome to Itasca Water's Practical Water Wisdom Series. Thank you so much for having me for this series, and thank you for that very kind introduction. My name is Sophie Green. I'm the PFAS coordinator here at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, and today I'm going to be talking all about PFAS. So my plan for this presentation is to start with just an overall introduction to what these chemicals are, uh, where we find them in Minnesota. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about what our different state agencies in Minnesota are doing to address this issue of PFAS contamination. And finally, I'll finish by sharing some um, advice about what you can do to, to be active in this area as well. So I'm sure many of you have heard of PFAS before, but I think it's really helpful to all start on the same grounding. Um, PFAS, of course, is an acronym. It's a mouthful. It stands for per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. Um, so there is an example of one PFAS on this slide here in the right corner of the slide. Um, it's PFOA, which is one member of this very large family of chemicals. So in this diagram, the gray dots represent carbon atoms. And in a normal chemical, we might have hydrogen bound to the, that carbon. But in the case of a PFAS, the chemists have replaced all or some of those hydrogen atoms with fluorine. And in this diagram, the fluorine atoms are in, in green. 
So the carbon fluorine bonds in these PFAS chemicals are the strongest bonds we can make in organic chemistry. Um, and they just do not break down on their own in the environment or in our bodies. And the carbon fluorine bonds is what makes PFAS unique. And it, it's what has earned this family of substances the name forever chemicals, um, because we essentially see that they last forever when we release them into our environment. So again, what, what this family of chemicals has in common is that they contain these carbon and fluorine bonds. Um, but beyond that, it's actually a very large and diverse family of substances. Um, so some chemicals in the PFAS family are polymers or plastics. Um, others are non-polymers or monomers that are soluble and mobile in the environment. Um, some PFAS are what we call precursors, which means that um, they're a chemical that was invented to be reactive in the factory to turn into something else. So those PFAS have a relatively short environmental half-life. They'll transform into a different PFAS relatively quickly on the order of hours or minutes or perhaps days. Um, we also have what we call intermediate degradates. So those are PFAS that um, are have opportunities to transform into other PFAS, but might stick around in the environment for a little bit longer. And finally, there are terminal degradates. So those are PFAS where there's no more transformation, chemical transformation possible in the environment. They're just gonna stay in their current form for pretty much forever. Um, PFOA, the, the chemical on this screen is an example of a terminal degradate in the PFAS family. And the half-life, the environmental half-lives for these chemicals are very, very long. They essentially just do not degrade. There's also a diversity in their physical and chemical properties. So some PFAS are soluble in water, um, others are not. Some PFAS might exist in the environment under normal conditions as a gas, others might act as a solid. Um, some, as we just described, have these differing environmental half-lives. Um, and there's also variety in the biological half-life of these chemicals. So biological half-life is the amount of time that it takes for our bodies to clear that chemical out of our system. And um, some PFAS, our bodies are able to identify quickly as a toxin and, and remove it from our bodies. Um, but other PFAS, our bodies have a really hard time removing. I um, mean, the biological half lives for some of these chemicals can be as long as 25 or even 30 years. So that means that it takes 30 years potentially for us to eliminate just half of our exposure of PFAS. Um, so with these chemical and, and variety of chemical and physical properties, there's a huge variety of useful traits that PFAS have. Um, many PFAS can repel oil and water at the same time, which is pretty unique for one chemical to be able to do both of those things. Um, they're incredibly stable, even under very high heat conditions or very corrosive conditions, which can be useful if you're in, in an industry or manufacturing um, they can be used to create very low friction surfaces. Um, they prevent oxidation and combustion. So you can often add PFAS to something if you don't want it to blow up or explode. And finally, they often can form these very stable foams. And that can have a lot of very useful applications in um, commercial products, but mostly also in industrial products. So with all these useful traits, the applications of PFAS are incredibly diverse. Um, so this slide just gives you some examples of ways that PFAS are used in industrial and commercial products in our economy. Um, but these are just examples. Uh, you could never create a PowerPoint slide with all of the applications of PFAS. And unfortunately, we just don't even know all the applications of PFAS because there are no requirements to disclose their use. Um, so one famous example of PFAS is in paper and food packaging. So if you think about your microwave popcorn bag, it's a really thin piece of paper. You put it in the microwave, it gets steamy and greasy inside that bag. Um, but somehow the bag doesn't degrade. You know, the bag doesn't fall apart. Um, you don't see grease stains all over it. Often that's because there's a PFAS lining on the inside of the microwave popcorn bag that's keeping all of that grease and water inside. Similarly, um, PFAS is often applied as uh, a stain resistant coating or a water resistant coating to things like furniture, or carpeting, leather, even clothing like a waterproof jacket. Um, PFAS are used in firefighting foams whenever that firefighting foam is trying to put out a, a liquid fire, like for example, a gasoline fire. It's used in the electronics industry, medical products. Um, it's used in the metal plating industry. Uh, for example, it's used to, to keep the amount of mist and um, volatiles down in, in part of that manufacturing process. Um, it's used in the oil and gas industry. Sometimes they will um, line pipes with this to have a nice smooth flow. Sometimes they'll add it to the fracking fluids. Um, PFAS have 
uh, been historically used as a pesticide here in the United States. And um, PFAS are often, are sometimes also used in the mining industry in some specialized types of, of mining processes. So there's applications all across our economy. Um, all right, so we have PFAS in all these types of commercial and industrial products. Um, how is it getting into our environment? So this diagram here is trying to show all of the different ways that PFAS can be released into our environment, um, move through different sectors of our environment, and then also move around through different types of waste management facilities um, that we have in our, in our communities. So if you look on the left side of the slide, there's a factory, um, let's say it's a PFAS manufacturing factory, um, they might be releasing some PFAS to the air. And when they release it to the air, it can stay in the atmosphere for a long time. It can travel really, really long distances. Um, and that PFAS will eventually come out of the atmosphere and back onto the surface of the earth through rain or through just dry deposition. So in that case, the PFAS can get into the soil, it can get into the surface water. In some cases, it can even get into the groundwater. Um, some of these uh, manufacturing facilities also discharge directly to a surface water body like a, like a river, or they might be releasing some of their liquid waste products to something like a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and unfortunately, all of the types of traditional technologies that we use to treat wastewater um, does nothing to remove PFAS. So anything that goes into a wastewater treatment plant as far as PFAS is likely to come out either in liquid form or in solid form through biosolids or sludge. Um, similarly, when we at home are using PFAS containing products like our microwave popcorn or um, perhaps even our Teflon pan, we might, uh, the use of that product might result in some PFAS liquid going down the drain. Um, and we also throw those materials out eventually, might end up in a landfill. Um, and the landfill uh, might then hold all of that PFAS where it can leach out into what we call leachate, which again is sent to that wastewater treatment plant and um, potentially released. So we have lots of ways that PFAS can be um, released to the air, released to the soil, released to the groundwater, surface water. And we see PFAS in all of those different media all around the state of Minnesota. All right, so um, it's, in, it's in everywhere in our environment. It's in the air, it's in the surface water, it's in the soil. Um, is it getting into our bodies? And unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes. Um, so PFAS has been measured in people's blood all over the country and all over the world. Um, actually, 99, over 99% 99 of all Americans have measurable amounts of these chemicals in our blood when we do these random surveys. So how is that happening? Um, in a lot of ways, um, that PFAS exposure is coming from environmental uh, routes. So one big way that people are exposed to PFAS is through their drinking water. We drink you know, anywhere from one to two liters of water a day. If that water is contaminated with PFAS, that could be a significant source of exposure. Um, but we also drink uh, unintentionally, sometimes drink a lot of water when we're out swimming and recreating on surface water bodies. Um, so, if you remember from your childhood getting water up your nose or swallowing water while you're swimming, um, that type of indirect water exposure can also be significant if you're swimming in a surface water body that has PFAS contamination. Similarly, um, we often don't, don't think about eating soil or sediment, but if you've ever seen a toddler play on a beach, they put a lot of stuff in their mouth. It's kind of shocking how much they can ingest. Um, and because these chemicals can live for a very, very long time in your body, um, that, that childhood exposure can be very significant. Um, we also see PFAS accumulating in fish that are living in surface water bodies that have uh, PFAS contamination. And if we eat that fish, that could be a significant source. Um, similarly, other states have, have seen high levels of contamination in, in game like deer. Um, and even other types of food can accumulate PFAS and work their way into our bodies. Lots of ways that we can have this PFAS transfer from environmental media into our bodies. Okay, so we all have PFAS in our blood. Um, that's not great news. What happens at that point? How does that PFAS interact with our biology? So here in Minnesota, uh, we're actually very lucky that we have a team of toxicologists and epidemiologists who um, are dedicated just to uh, determining what types of risks are posed by environmental contaminants. Um, that's that's actually relatively unique for states to have their own expertise in this area. So we're really happy that we have our colleagues in the Minnesota Department of Health who can do these assessments. Um, and they have done health assessments for six different members of the PFAS family. Um, so the ones listed on this slide are the chemicals where they've 
um, done a huge amount of work compiling all of the peer reviewed scientific literature that exists on uh, animal studies. So where toxicologists have dosed, you know, uh, mice, rats, dogs, monkeys with known quantities of these substances, um, and then observed what happens to their bodies as a result. Um, and we also have a lot of epidemiological studies where um, unfortunately communities have been highly exposed with these chemicals and um, we can track the health of those people in those communities over time, compare them to people who have not been exposed and determine if there are increased risks in various types of areas. So our, our colleagues at MDH, um, they, compile all of this toxicology information, all of this epidemiological information. And the first thing they do is identify what bad things could happen to your body if you've been exposed to these chemicals. Um, and the second thing they do is calculate a concentration at which those negative effects will not occur, right? So a safe threshold. So when they're compiling all the bad potential things that can happen to your body for these six PFAS, um, unfortunately, they came up with a lot of different things, which is not good news. Um, so we've seen that some of these PFAS can cause problems in our immune system. Um, so we've seen in epidemiological studies that children who have been exposed to PFAS in their early life, um, either during pregnancy or in, in the first few years of their life, have a decreased vaccine uh, a decreased antibody response to vaccines compared to other children who did not have exposure. So something's happening in their immune system to uh, result in them having a, a less active response to vaccination. We also see other developmental effects or effects early in life or during pregnancy. Um, we see effects to the reproductive system, um, including thyroid hormone issues. Um, almost all of these PFAS impact our livers. And in the case of PFOA, we see strong evidence of carcinogenicity. So the exposure to PFOA is associated with a few types of cancer, including um, kidney cancer. So one thing worth noting here is that um, we have these health, ass health assessments for six individual chemicals in the PFAS family, um, but this is a huge family of chemicals. There are over 5,000 individual chemicals in the family. Um, so for the vast majority of PFAS, we just do not have enough toxicity data to derive these health-based benchmarks. Uh, we don't know what effects those chemicals might cause on our bodies, and we don't know what the safety thresholds would be. So one reason we're especially concerned about this whole family of substances as far as impacts to our health um, is because we know that PFAS can transfer from a pregnant mother um, to her developing baby. So this is a, a figure from a study that was just published very recently. Um, they, they measured PFAS in the blood of all of the moms in this very large cohort of pregnant women. Um, and then when the baby was born, they also measured the PFAS levels in the placenta, so in the cord. And then finally, they measured PFAS in the breast milk of the women in the study. And what they found was that PFAS was present in, in all of these women. In their blood, it was present in the placental cord. And that means that the babies are getting exposed in utero, so during development. And then the PFAS was also present. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm in a room with auto lights. Um, the PFAS was also present in the breast milk. Um, and in at least one case, for this chemical 6,2-dipath, which again is a, one of these PFAS chemicals, um, the concentration in the placental cord blood and in the breast milk was actually higher than the concentration in the mother, which means that in this case, uh, the, the child is getting even more exposed than the mother. So we're concerned about this because um, we've seen that the serum levels or the exposure might be the highest in your entire life in those very early years of development when you're building new organ systems and you're very sensitive to potential environmental contamination. All right, uh, another reason we're especially concerned about PFAS is because we've seen that some members of this family can accumulate very dramatically in the edible parts of fish tissue. So I apologize for this very uh, low tech graphic here, but what I'm trying to communicate is that even at very low levels of surface water contamination, because there is so much accumulation into the fish tissue, somebody eating a fish swimming in that water body can have a lot of exposure. So we've seen with the one chemical called PFOS that concentrations in fish tissue are over 7,000 times higher than the surrounding surface water. And that means that fish consumption can be a really significant route of exposure. So in Minnesota, we have been looking at PFAS in fish tissue since the early 2000s, and we've collected a lot of data all over the state. 
So this map shows you where we have some data right now. Um, the yellow dots indicate that results are, are pretty low for PFOS in that fish tissue. Um, but as you get to the higher levels, like the oranges and the reds, that indicates that there's an elevated level of PFOS in those fish tissue. And you can see that we see some oranges and reds um, all over Minnesota, not just in the metro area. So whenever we see one of these orange or red results, um, we try to identify an, a nearby source of PFOS that could be causing to those elevated levels of PFAS in the fish. Um, but that's a really time intensive effort. We have a handful of success stories where we've been able to find the PFOS source. Uh, for example, in one case, there was a metal plating company that was releasing PFOS to a nearby water body. Uh, we were able to stop that release, reduce the levels in the water body, and come back later and see reduced levels in the fish. So that was a success, which was wonderful. But in many cases, we actually can't find or we haven't yet found the source of PFOS to that water body. Um, and investigating those sources is a very time and labor intensive process. So right now we've just collected 500 new samples that we're slowly getting data back on. Um, so we're constantly adding new fish tissue to this process, um, identifying elevated, elevated uh, surface water bodies and, and trying to investigate those sources. And of course, we're very concerned about um, this in Minnesota because um, we have lots of people in the state who are fishing for lots of different reasons. Um, there are folks who fish for recreational purposes. There are folks who are subsistence fishers. So they're relying on this as a source of food for their families. And then um, there's a lot of different people who, who fish as part of their cultural her heritage. Um, and we've seen in studies in the United States that folks who uh, report that they eat freshwater fish um, have elevated PFAS serum levels compared to people who do not eat freshwater fish, and the serum levels in these fish consumers is correlated to the number of freshwater fish meals they consume each year. So that indicates that this fish consumption route of exposure could be very significant in driving their overall exposure levels. So in Minnesota, um, we already have several water bodies that we list as impaired um, and on the basis of fish consumption because of the PFOS levels that we found in those fish. And we have some water bodies around the state that have do not eat advice, which means that our Department of Health suggests that you do not eat any fish um, that was harvested from that water body. All right, so um, I think I've laid out the problem pretty well here. What is, what is Minnesota doing about this issue of PFAS? So in February of 2021, um, we published a document that we call Minnesota, Minnesota's PFAS Blueprint. And the idea behind this document um, was to be a was to support a holistic and systematic process for addressing PFAS across all of our state agencies and within our agencies across all of our different programs and policies and regulations. So this is a complex topic. It touches all different parts of our economy, all different parts of our regulatory structure. And we wanted to keep all of this com complexity as in mind as we proposed a strategic path forward. Um, so you can read more about this Minnesota's PFAS blueprint on our website, and I encourage um, anyone who's interested to go ahead and, and leaf through it. Um, the main takeaway from this blueprint is that we have a priority in place for action. So our first priority is to prevent PFAS pollution wherever possible. Um, PFAS preventing that pollution is by far the most cost effective way to deal with this issue. Um, and it's also the most health protective way to deal with this issue. However, um, PFAS are incredibly persistent in our environment. And long before we published our PFAS blueprint, we had PFAS releases into our environment and we can't prevent pollution that has already occurred. Um, so where we have um, historic pollution or where we have releases that will continue into the future that can't be prevented, uh, we'd like to manage that PFAS pollution um, in a way that is protective of human health and the environment. And if we can't prevent that pollution and we can't manage it, or it hasn't been prevented, it hasn't been managed, of course, we will need to clean up that PFAS contamination um, if it's threatening human health and the environment. Uh, but cleanups for PFAS in particular are very expensive and they're very time consuming. So we want to do everything we can to prevent creating additional cleanup sites. Um, the first step, no matter where you are in this process of preventing, managing, or cleaning up PFAS pollution, is measuring. Um, so measurement is the first step to reduction. And our PFAS blueprint lists a lot of different uh, projects that focus on this idea of measurement. So we talk about wanting to understand how much PFAS is coming out of the landfills in our state, how much it might be coming out of our, our municipal wastewater treatment plants, um, how much 
how much PFAS might be coming out of our, um, our facilities that are permitted for wastewater or stormwater or air releases. And finally, we wanted to understand the landscape of PFAS at our existing cleanup sites. So we created this initiative called our PFAS monitoring plan. And the idea was to coordinate all of these different um, measurements and investigation projects under one umbrella. So the goal of our PFAS monitoring plan is to gather is threefold. Um, the first goal is to gather Minnesota specific information uh, that we can use to craft a really effective regulations around PFAS in all of our programs. The second goal is to identify if there are any areas of particular concern in our state right now that warrant rapid follow up action. So of course, PFAS are invisible to the naked eye. We can't smell them, we can't see them. The only way we're gonna know if we have a significant contamination area is if we go out and, and look for it. And then the third goal is to um, gather some information that we hope will galvanize support for PFAS source reduction and pollution prevention initiatives. So we started this PFAS monitoring plan effort uh, back last summer. Um, we spent a long time working with communities and stakeholders to develop this plan, a, a robust plan that would be um, give us the information we need to, to meet our three goals. Uh, we released that plan in draft form, we solicited some more input, and finally we released the plan uh, last spring. And right now we're in the process of implementing the plan. Um, we hope to have our first round of results uh, ready by the end of 2023 or early 2024. Um, so I, this topic can be very overwhelming, um, especially if, if um, PFAS is not something that you've heard of before. So I wanted to spend the last uh, bit of this presentation talking about uh, things that you can do um, to, to reduce your exposure to PFAS and stay active in this process. Um, so the, the main point that I want to make is that um, even though we all have PFAS in our bodies, um, everything we do to limit our exposure reduces our health risks. So um, one thing that I recommend that folks do if they're, if they're concerned about PFAS exposure is to check if their drinking water has been tested for PFAS. So in Minnesota, we have um, monitored for, or we're in the process of monitoring PFAS in all public water systems around the state. So if you get your, if you get your water from a public utility, um, you will be able to find PFAS results on our uh, and our online dashboard. So I included the link to the dashboard here on this slide, um, but if you don't have time to write that all down, I'm sure if you just Google PFAS drinking water dashboard Minnesota, um, it will be the first thing that, that shows up on Google. In um, addition to our public water systems, uh, MPCA and the Minnesota Department of Health have collaborated on, on doing a lot of private drinking water testing in areas where we have known contamination issues. Um, so if you're curious if your drinking well, if your private drinking water well has been tested in the past, um, or if you want to learn more about how you might be able to get your private drinking water well tested, um, I encourage you to go to this website as well. Um, or I think you can also just Google PFAS drinking water wells, um, and you'll be able to get to that link as well. All right, uh, another thing that I recommend people do is uh, learn about the levels of PFAS in the uh, water bodies where you like to fish. So in our Department of Health has a fish consumption guideline um, for PFOS, and they will list specific uh, guidelines for water bodies on their website. So if you go to this uh, link here, uh, I put a screenshot of what that website looks like. You, you find the section for safe eating guidelines and you click on water body specific safe eating guidelines. And that will pull up a long list of all of the water bodies in Minnesota where there has been some site specific guidance around how much fish um, is safe to eat. So if you just look up the water body they're going to, you'll be able to see if there's recommendations around limited consumption for PFOS. Um, and if you do fish in an area where there are um, safe eating guidelines or more restrictive fish consumption advice for that water body, um, think about maybe fishing somewhere else or catch and release fishing in that area, just to make sure that you don't exceed those, those Department of Health guidance. Um, another thing you can try to do is learn about um, how much PFAS might be in some of the consumer products that you like to use. Um, so one thing that I, I uh, have, one reason why I have a hard time giving this advice to people is because there is actually no requirement right now to disclose whether or not there is PFAS in a product. So as much as we tell people to avoid PFAS in consumer products, um, it can be really hard for someone to actually act on that advice because if you go to the ingredients list, you're never gonna see the word PFAS written. 
So um, sometimes you might be able to get a clue. Um, if the product lists a chemical that has the term fluoro in it, um, it might be a PFAS product. Um, some products are labeling their, their items as PFAS free. Um, so if you see that, that's a, that's a good thing to look for, but I would be careful. Um, sometimes people are also labeling things as just PFOS free or PFOA free. Um, and that means that there's not that one specific chemical, but there are probably other PFAS chemicals in that product. But anytime you're looking for a consumer product that is a suspect for PFAS use, for example, something that is stain resistant or water resistant or non-stick, um, it might be a good idea to look for, for fluoro sounding chemicals in the ingredient list and check to see if there are any products that are labeled PFAS free. All right, so um, if you can avoid consumer products that contain PFAS, that's great. Um, but in some cases, um, if you're concerned about your individual exposure, avoiding that consumer product might not be so necessary to do. So for something like ski wax, there actually is a lot of ski wax out there that contains large amounts of PFAS in it. Often these are called fluoro waxes and they're designed to be extra slick um, racing condition ski waxes. Um, and we've seen, unfortunately, that using that ski wax not only results in PFAS releases uh, to the environment, the snow around where you're racing gets high concentrations of PFAS, um, but also in the process of applying that ski wax, you're potentially causing a lot of exposure for yourself. You can be inhaling some of that particulate material um, or getting it on your clothes or getting it on your skin. So there's a lot of potential exp exposure in the ski wax area. Um, and you know you don't really need fluorinated ski wax to ski. You could use non-fluorinated ski wax and you'll be just fine. So that's an, that's an area where I think it's very logical to, to try to avoid a PFAS containing product. Um, similarly, post-market waterproofing sprays. Um, there's a lot of potential for exposure as you're using that material. Um, and after you've used the, the spray, for example, to waterproof your couch, um, you could get PFAS in the dust in your house that you can ex be exposed to um, through inhalation. Some products where it's not always uh, necessarily a direct exposure route that we're concerned about might be something like a Teflon pan. So for the most part, the PFAS in a Teflon pan is a polymer. It's not something that you're going to be exposed to directly by eating off of that pan. On the other hand, uh, when you throw out that pan, there might be some potential for release. And when that pan was created at the factory, there was probably a potential for PFAS release. So we're, we're not so concerned about direct exposure from that product, but we might be concerned about indirect exposure. Um, similarly, something like a, a mask. So we're all wearing masks now, um, or we used to be wearing them a lot more probably because of the pandemic. A lot of those surgical masks are coated with PFAS. Um, you've probably noticed that they're a little stain resistant and that they're a little water resistant. That's probably a PFAS coating. Um, so, you know, that might not cause a lot of risk for direct exposure. Similarly, you're getting a benefit by wearing that mask because you're not getting sick. Um, but there could be a, an indirect potential for releasing PFAS when those masks are made or when those masks are thrown out. So consumer products are a really hard one to talk about. Um, there are concerns about direct exposure. There are concerns about whether or not that um, product is essential, like maybe a mask might be essential for you or non-essential, like something like ski wax. Um, so it's complicated, but if you can avoid PFAS in, in products, um, it's great to do so whenever you can. Um, another thing I'll, I'll mention here is that um, there is guidance out there right now um, for both doctors and patients about how to um, respond to your PFAS exposure. So if you are listening to this presentation and you're thinking, wow, I might have had a lot of PFAS exposure in my life, um, you might want to talk to your doctor about uh, what you can do to have your blood tested for PFAS and if there's any follow-up actions that might be worthwhile. Um, so here's a, I put on this webpage a link to the National Academy's uh, report on guidance for PFAS testing and clinical response. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at the fact sheet for patients. Um, and if your doctor's not aware of PFAS, you can send them that information. There's a whole separate set of guidance that are specifically um, designed for talking to doctors about how to treat people with high levels of PFAS exposure. And then the last thing I'll say here is that um, I always encourage people to be engaged with the local, state, and federal government on issues related to PFAS. Um, there are a lot of opportunities uh, right now and in the future to provide public comment on rules and regulations related to PFAS. Um, sometimes there are public meetings that you might be able to attend on this topic. 
We at the, the MPCA have a website about how to get engaged in the rulemaking process. Um, and this is an incredibly hot topic right now at all levels of government, local, state, and federal. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities to have your voice heard. And I encourage you to, um, to, to speak up if, if this is something that you're interested in. All right, so I think I am all done with the presentation and hopefully we have some questions. Wow, Sophie, that was absolutely outstanding. Terrific talk, I really appreciate it. Um, outstanding, but deeply disturbing and uh, in a lot of ways. So now I'd like to bring in Itasca Waters board member and manager of Itasca County's AIS program, Bill, Bill Granches for the Q&A section. Bill? Thank you, John, and welcome everyone to our question and answer session. Be sure that you submit your questions by using the Q&A function. Do not use the chat function. I'll read the questions, uh, and we do have quite a few questions here. Uh, I'll read them aloud, and then Sophie will answer them. Um, if we do not get to your question, and you can always uh, send us an email, and we will get the answer back to you via email. Okay, our first question. Do household water filters, like those for lead and arsenic, remove <laughs> PAPs, PAPs, PF, remove these. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could say PFAS or PFAS. I think either one is, a, is an appropriate, oh, sorry. Um, either one's a good, a good way. So um, yes, there are carbon filters available that you can put on, on your own house that will remove PFAS. Um, I recommend that you, if you do choose to purchase one of those filters, make sure that you get an NSF certified filter for PFAS removal. So the, the NSF has uh, tested these products. They have approved ones that have been shown to effectively remove PFAS and make sure that you purchase one of those because not every carbon filter will remove PFAS. Thank you. Next question. How can we get our well water tested and how much does it cost? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, there's there's two routes here. So there are folks who have wells that are in areas where we have known areas of contamination um, and the state has funding to do that testing on your behalf. Um, if you live in one of those contamination areas, there is a form on our website that you can fill out um, and someone will contact you and arrange a time to collect that sample and then they'll communicate the results back to you. Um, if you don't live in one of those areas of contamination, known contamination, um, unfortunately, our state does not have funding right now to, to cover the cost of those wells, the well testing. But the Department of Health has a website up right now where they list different private companies who you can work with to have those uh, tests done. In general, we're finding that uh, it can cost anywhere from $200 to $500 per sample. Uh, to analyze for PFAS. So it is costly. It is much more costly than other types of contaminants to, to analyze. Wow. Okay. Um, next question. Actually, there are two very similar questions. I'll, I'll kind of read both. Uh, do PFAS concentrate in the atmosphere in northern latitudes was the first one. And then the second one is, in north central Minnesota, our lakes get a lot of their nutrients from rain and snow. Are PFAS transmitted through the atmosphere? Yeah, this is an excellent question. So um, the short answer is yes, uh, PFAS are transmitted through the atmosphere. So um, especially the, the probably the, the biggest sources to the atmosphere likely are the major floral manufacturing facilities. Um, and over time they have changed what types of PFAS they generate. And we've seen changes in the PFAS that we find in the atmosphere. So we, we do think that those are probably the major sources. And when they release these substances to the atmosphere, um, they do interact with the atmosphere in such a way that can concentrate them at Northern latitudes. Um, so we've seen, for example, in some of these long chain PFAS com compounds, um, concentrations that are very high at the poles. And we've seen even very high concentrations in, for example, polar bears, um, and unfortunately in the blood of, of, um, of indigenous folks who hunt in, in the Arctic area. Um, so we do see a concentration in the Northern latitudes that we attribute to atmospheric transport patterns. Um, wow. I think so there was another question about atmospheric transporter. Did I did I catch the whole thing? Um, I think you, you got it pretty well. Okay. They're asking about do they concentrate in northern latitudes? So yeah, yeah, and there is, I will say that there is an atmospheric component, even not in um 
you know, there's atmospheric component to, to PFAS releases everywhere in the globe. So we've gone to remote areas where no humans have ever lived before. We've seen PFAS in the rain and PFAS in the soil. Um, it's worth noting that the levels of PFAS that we see in the rain, um, not near a release site are very, very, very low. Um, so not necessarily levels of concern, but it is disturbing to know that these are ever present everywhere in the globe. Wow. You know, in, in Itasca County, we're very proud of our pristine waters and our lakes. Uh, this next question uh, deals with, are there PFAFs detectable in the groundwater or in our aquifers that you know of? Yeah, so that's another great question. So in Minnesota, we have a network of wells that are located all over the state that are measuring PFAS in ambient groundwater. And the idea when they designed this network was that they were trying to have an early warning system for potential contaminants of concern um, so that they would just regularly be looking for, for lots of different contaminants of emerging concern, including PFAS in areas where you wouldn't necessarily expect to see them. And unfortunately, what we found in that ambient well monitoring network is that PFAS are present in almost every single well in our system. Um, the majority of wells in our system, I will say. And in some cases, uh, for some individual chemicals, almost all of the wells have some detection. Um, again, the vast majority of those, the concentrations are lower than health levels of health concern. Um, so we're not seeing, you know, that, that water would still be safe to drink from a PFAS perspective. However, um, we are seeing uh, detections of some PFAS in those waters. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine another set of questions here. It has to do with bioaccumulation of PFAS in fish. Um, since some PFAS are water soluble and some are oil soluble, do PFAS get concentrated in particular organs or fats in fish differently? Yeah, that's a great question. So most of the PFAS that are on our high priority list right now, um, they bind to protein. So they behave differently than something like a PCB or a mercury, which is very soluble in lipids. Um, and they, they, they bind to the protein. So we see them in the um, edible fillets of the fish. Uh, we also see them in fish liver, um, but it, they do not follow the same patterns as some of these other fish tissue contaminants of concern. Let's see. All right, next question. Very recently, this person uh, heard a news report of some potential progress on breaking PFAFs down in the environment. Do you have any knowledge or exposure to that data? And would you share some comments on it if you do? Yeah, I was very excited to read this paper. So there was recently um, a paper that was published in Science um, where a actually a graduate student discovered that if you have um, PFOA, which again is one of these chemicals of concern within the PFAS family, and you essentially boil it in something called DMSO, which is a solvent and lye, um, you can pop the, the top off the head of that chemical and slowly strip off one fluorine at a time, which is really exciting. Um, previously, when we've tried to destroy PFAS, um, we haven't taken this chemistry heavy approach. We've just thrown essentially as much heat and energy at the chemical as we can to try to get it to, to break down. Um, and that's been uh, moderately successful, um, but it requires huge amounts of energy. So taking like a, like a PFAS concentrate and putting it into a plasma reactor, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of energy and a lot of time um, to break down that chemical. So if we're able to find lower energy solutions for destroying some of these chemicals, that's going to be a huge benefit in terms of the cost associated with cleanup. Um, I will say though that there are a lot of limitations to this technology. Um, this was just presenting a lot of the fundamental science behind how a future technology would work. So they haven't actually built the technology yet. Um, and so far it only works on um, some of the PFAS in the family called carboxylates. It doesn't work on sulfonates. Um, so you know, there's, there's a lot to be done in terms of developing this into a functional technology, but it's really exciting to see a more elegant solution to PFAS destruction than just throwing as much energy at it as you can possibly muster. Wonderful. I have one last question here. You've sort of answered it, um, part of it anyway. Does Lake Superior have PFAS? And if so, do you know where it comes from? 
Yeah, so there are of course low levels of PFAS in Lake Superior because there are low level low levels of PFAS in pretty much every surface water body on the on the globe. Um, we are in the in the grand scheme of things, seeing that Lake Superior is still very clean with respect to PFAS. Um, so we're seeing some PFAS accumulating in some types of fish in Lake Superior, but in other types of fish, we're not seeing detections of PFAS. Um, and um, overall, it's looking like Lake Superior is cleaner with respect to PFAS than any of the other Great Lakes. Um, so that's that's good news. Um, we don't know of the sources of PFAS to that lake. It could be that a lot of the sources are atmospheric. It could be that we have some point sources along the shore that are contributing to PFAS in that water body. Um, a lot of those 500 fish samples I mentioned that we just collected this year and are in the process of analyzing, a lot of those are from Lake Superior and the surrounding tributaries. Um, and we think that the results of that study will help us dial in on point sources into Lake Superior if they exist. Wow. You know what? I'm going to throw in a question of my own <laughs> on, on this one. Um, since I deal with aquatic invasive species and we've all heard of zebra mussels, zebra mussels are filter feeders. Do you know, have there been any studies that are examining the waste surrounding the areas of a zebra mussel uh, containing concentration of PFAS? No, that's a really excellent question. I don't know about um, zebra mussels in particular in terms of the way that they might be impacting PFAS in a water body. Um, I do know that we've done a lot of studies of mussels and clams, other types of filter feeders. Um, and we've seen that the chemical PFOA actually shockingly accumulates in very high amounts in clams. And the FDA recently, the, the Food and Drug Administration recently issued um, one of their first voluntary recalls related to PFAS for food products, and it was all clams um, and their PFOA uh, concentrations. So I think this question around how um, zebra mussels might be impacting PFAS cycling through a water body, um, I think that's a really interesting question. One of the many areas of potential research when it comes to PFAS. I think I'll pass that one on to May, sir. <laughs> um, that does it for our questions, Sophie. Um, thank you everyone for submitting all those fantastic questions. John, let's get back to you. Thanks so much, Bill. That concludes our program for today and how excellent it was. I hope you enjoyed the sixth program in the Itasca Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series. Itasca Waters, thanks Sophie Green for today's program. It was fantastically interesting. And as I said before, a little concerning, pretty concerning. We thank Bill Grantius for hosting the Q&A portion. And thanks also to Kathy Cohn, who's a Itasca Waters board member for handling all the background work on the Q&A. Most importantly, we thank you for having the interest in clean water and taking the time to be here today with us. A big tip of the hat goes to the Itasca Waters Education Committee and its partners for all they've done to produce today's program, as well as um, all those to follow this year, the, the next two. Today's program was recorded and will soon be available on our website, itascawaters.org. Um, at the close of the program, uh, when it terminates, you'll see a little message uh, asking you to fill out an evaluation. We'd really like it if you would do that. We'll also be e emailing that later. We hope that you use that um, evaluation form to give Itasca Waters a feedback that we need to make these programs even better. Um, our next live program will be at noon on October 6th entitled Land Use and Forestry Impacts on Water. You can sign up now by going to our website, itaskawaters.org. I'm John Downing. Thanks and see you on October 6th. <laughs>